Um, and without further ado, I'd love to introduce our next speaker. Uh, she's the recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship, the NSF Career Award, Young Investigator Awards from the DOD, and holds faculty fellowships from Microsoft, Google, Facebook, as well as Adobe. Please welcome to the stage Bren, Professor at Caltech and Director of Machine Learning Research at NVIDIA. Sorry, Director of Machine Learning Research at NVIDIA. The accomplishments are so many, I was trying to read them fast. Uh, please welcome Anima Anand Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, RT. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really glad uh, uh, there is now so much focus on data centric AI. So today I'll give you a few projects we've been working. Um, primarily these projects have been at NVIDIA looking at how to deal with imperfect data, imperfect labels, right? Uh, there are so many challenges when we're trying to apply AI in the real world. And so much of it has to do with the imperfections in data. And I'll give you some ways to get around that, design better, robust methods. And this is indeed, right, an endeavor uh, that will keep on going uh, as we see more of AI in the real world. So indeed, if you think about real world data, there's all kinds of uh, challenges, right? There can be domain gaps, you know, what we train for is very different um, than uh, what we encounter. Um, and the biases in data, this is something now, thankfully there is a lot of awareness compared to when we were just getting started with AI a few years ago especially the aspect that uh, many uh, underrepresented communities uh, could also be the one subject to societal bias. So having models that haven't seen data from underrepresented communities is a huge problem, especially when used in problematic scenarios like law enforcement, uh, which could mean life and death in many situations. So these are things uh, we need to be very careful about. I mean, if the data we collect has inevitable imbalances, how do we design methods that can overcome that? And indeed, there is also the noise, right? And the noise can be in so many different ways. Uh, it could be through occlusions, different kinds of clutter, or even just ambiguity of, uh, you know, what is in the image, right? And that's uh, something that uh, current uh, labeling techniques are not really designed to handle. And that comes to the aspect of labels. You know, the way we uh, label images, uh, it's considered a right mundane task, a laborious task, but uh, something that's not uh, you know given as much care as we should be doing, and that results many times in label noise, right? So you can have ambiguity, and there are also cultural issues, right? Different cultures may label the image uh, in different ways. Um, and it's also laborious, you know, trying to label uh, the entire like segmentation here of this complex image uh, would be hugely laborious if done by hand uh, by humans. And for um, you know applications like autonomous driving of long videos, this becomes untenable. And so this data hungry revolution is also challenging now because having humans label that volume of data is extremely expensive. So now the question is, can we overcome ideally with even no labels, right? Can we do unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning uh, in different uh, scenarios to overcome these issues? And so the trinity uh, that we see at NVIDIA is to think about uh, three aspects, right? Like how do we deal with inexact supervision right, so that you may have label noise, and also incomplete, so you don't get the supervision of everything, uh, but only partial labels. And um, it's also inaccurate in many ways. So how to overcome the uncertainty uh, due to partial supervision and potentially wrong supervision. And indeed, there are uh, many different techniques that I have been designed to um, get around this problem of imperfect labels and lack of enough label data. Um, Self-supervision has been very popular over the last few years where we're creating supervision based on invariances in data. You know, you can do different kind of uh, 
essentially data augmentations, right? You can crop the image, you can add different kinds of noise, you can um, transform the image in different ways. And if we know that the label is invariant um, to those transformations, we've now created uh, supervision just based on these invariances. And um, this aspect has been uh, uh, really uh, useful uh, in many scenarios. In fact, self-supervised learning has even beat supervised learning uh, in classification tasks. So this shows the power of uh, having us capture these data invariances through augmentations. And uh, there's indeed a lot of work also on what kind of structure in neural networks uh, should be designed, what kind of neural network architectures. And I'll show you some of the latest transformer uh, architectures makes a big difference in being robust. Even though transformers are data hungry, I think having the right design can overcome some of the issues and also provide better inherent robustness. And that's also a form of regularization, right? And you can have explicit regularization of different forms to overcome uh, the issue of noise. Um, and even like inductive bias, in, in some scenarios, we've seen how thinking about angular distances, right, rather than the usual L2 loss uh, can be much more robust. And also understanding the domain, um, you know, if you are thinking about autonomous driving, what kinds of objects could occur, what kinds of noise could occur are things that we can incorporate rather than designing for every possible kind of um, corruption. And lastly, synthetic data is still in its infancy, but will become hugely important in future. We already see its importance for from, you know, testing uh, systems such as autonomous driving or from robot learning where on the physical robot, you can't possibly create billions of runs. So in these extremely data, uh, you know, uh, uh, limited scenario, synthetic data becomes important. And so methods that can do synthetic to real uh, adaptation uh, will be very critical because there is huge domain gap, but how do we overcome that? And so the first work that I'll show you what we call disco box, um, what you can see here is it only has box supervision, right? So we do not have supervision of these instant segmentation, uh, but you can see here, um, in fact, it's not even trained on this video. Uh, this is just directly evaluated by our trained model. And you can see really good quality uh, segmentation of people, even though it's not been trained with uh, segmentation labels. And so that's why we call it disco box because it's only using box supervision. So this is the only label present in the image, but we can output um, the instant segmentation. You can see these refined segmentations and also um, the uh, correspondences. So like uh, ultimately like, you know, we want is uh, 3D correspondences, right? So how do we do this uh, with just limited supervision? So I won't get into the details here, but the main idea is we can create now self-supervision uh, based on uh, right, positive and negative backs, right? So if you have this box, you can like create positive backs within the box and negative backs outside the, um, you know, the supervised box. And based on this, we can do multiple instance learning for instance segmentation. And then for correspondences, what we can do is uh, having a self ensembling with a structured teacher. And the whole idea is we can look at multiple in images, right, through a memory bank and uh, uh, have uh, the refined instant segmentation based on our uh, trained model. And then on top of it, we can also uh, create a differentiable Hungarian matching laws. Uh, to create correspondences across images. So now we are having these um, dense correspondences of um, what, um, how these images in objects in one image correspond to objects in the other. And so this mechanism helps us get this uh, rich information uh, with just uh, having box supervision, right? So 
um, for some reason this is not playing, but we can also show this on right uh, uh, AV data. We can, I, you saw the earlier video, so we can get these refined uh, segmentation, instant segmentation and correspondences using just uh, box supervision. And this is where we see like lots of examples of uh, correspondences right across images. Um, and being able to do it with no supervision. So this will appear in ICCV this year. So I encourage you to go check out uh, online for more details. This is already available online. So the next aspect I want to quickly give you some insights is how to make use of all the synthetic data and adapt to the real world. And the first aspect for this is we need to think about uncertainty estimation. Right, because inevitably, when we are going through such big domain shifts, we have to worry, you know, at least if it fails, it should fail in a graceful way. And that means we should uh, give the right uncertainty of failure. Um, and this is a problem with standard um, deep learning methods, right? So even when it's failing, it could fail with very high confidence. Uh, so this is a problem, and uh, there have been several measures uh, that have been proposed to overcome this. A simple one is temperature scaling. Uh, but temperature scaling is not so effective when we have a domain gap, right? So when there is a domain gap, you know, you're not as good uh, with handling the temperature through temperature scaling, the, uh, the uh, lack of uncertainty calibration. We've also explored angular distances as a more robust way to get reliable estimates. Uh, there's also Bayesian deep learning methods, but they tend to be heavy, right? They tend to be expensive. So the one that I'll quickly give an intuition is what we call a distributionally robust learning method that has um, uh, its um, you know, foundations and statistics. But the main thing to uh, really think about is, you know, this would be the standard classifier here. In addition, what we have is a density ratio. So what we are measuring is how different is the likelihood of this data point under source distribution versus the target distribution. So in this example here, the source distribution is synthetic data, right? And the target distribution is real data. And so what we have is now another network looking at uh, a particular image, how likely is it to have come from the source distribution? How likely is it to have come from target distribution? So you're really measuring that ratio of densities. And to do that, all we require is a binary classifier. So what we are doing is classifying each image, whether it belongs to training set or test set, that is source set or the target set. And by doing so, what we are able to glean is how far is this image from the training data. And so images that are far from training data will uh, be right down weighted here because this density ratio will be small and hence will have lower confidence. And so this now becomes an end to end training here. So we can train both the task network. And if you're doing a classification task, you can train it jointly with also training now a binary classifier, which will assess how far is this current test data point from the source training um, distribution. And so having this be jointly trained means we can also get now good uh, uncertainty calibration along with uh, uh, good classification. So we use this to do domain adaptation of synthetic to real. Uh, this is the distributionally robust method. Uh, getting better accuracy, we also got better calibration. And this method here, what we did was to combine it with self-training. So in self-training, you're looking at uncertainty of your uh, uh, classified labels, right, uh, from, the classif from your task network at test time. And uh, you're only looking at the confident labels and retraining your network. So this is being self-trained on the pseudo labels generated uh, by the current model. And so we need to be very conservative and train on only those pseudo labels where the confidence level is high. And we need to have calibrated uncertainty to be able to do that. 
And that's what we see here, uh, that by using uh, the distributionally robust method, where we are training for uncertainty through this uh, density ratio estimator, and that is simply a binary classifier of training and test data, we are able to get good uh, accuracy estimates of domain adaptation. So uncertainty estimation is an important um, step in this self-training and having good uncertainty estimates ultimately helps also in domain adaptation. And the other aspect that's important is interpretability, right? So we need to make sure that um, the uh, images uh, that have lower confidence are also something humans think are also harder, right? And, and that is clear here, right? This train here, there's less clutter, right? Uh, in a way, shape-wise, it looks similar to the source training, uh, but here, this one has a lot of clutter and hence is harder. So the density ratio can also be a way to quickly filter out the hard examples and maybe get additional labels, uh, maybe uh, make sure the model uh, you know, uh, if how it's able to do on these harder images. Uh, so that's the other aspect that's important, uh, interpretability. And um, so indeed, I quickly <coughs> talked about um, self-training as a way to uh, do domain adaptation. Um, so ultimately, what we want is good representation learning, right? And if you're only training on synthetic data, that tends to fail. You know, you tend to have collapsed representations because there isn't the natural diversity we see in real images. And so what we've uh, proposed is methods like contrastive uh, knowledge distillation that essentially balances between training on the synthetic source data and also on, on the, um, right, um, um, a frozen, say, ImageNet or some backbone that we begin with. Um, so that way you're uh, making sure that you're keeping this rich uh, real uh, representation while also training on the label data that we have in the synthetic domain. So this balance between keeping uh, rich representations from real data, but from a, say, different task and uh, having synthetic data for the current task uh, but it doesn't have the rich representation and there's a domain shift. Balancing the two becomes important. And this form of contrastive learning helps us, uh, you know, keep this rich representation. And the other aspect of representation learning that is very challenging is when we are doing um, uh, reinforcement learning, right? So visual reinforcement learning is hard because it's high dimensional. So we are directly going from pixels to actions. It becomes very challenging as in this example here. And so to um, be able to train uh, not just for normal scenes, right? So test time, you can have all these unseen weather conditions, unseen, right, uh, road conditions. So to uh, be able to handle this, what we require is uh, data augmentations. But this is very popular in uh, self-supervised learning, right? So we can put all kinds of data augmentations, train the model, make it very robust. But with reinforcement learning, that is not possible because optimization is going to be untenable. So essentially, you will not have your uh, uh, agent uh, be able to make improvements if the augmentations are too strong. Uh, so instead, what we did was to have a student teacher model. So in, uh, the teacher, right, or the expert learns the policy, but only on weak augmentations, uh, because with strong augmentations, it ju just can't learn the policy from scratch. Um, but if it is only trained on weak augmentations, it will not be robust. On the other hand, what we do is imitation learning with the student. Right, and the student now has strong data augmentations, but it is getting the supervision of the action from the teacher. And this becomes uh, very useful for it to now learn also the strong augmentations. So this kind of two-stage approach help, helps us beat the optimization issues that arise in reinforcement learning and still get um, robust representations um, that can handle all kinds of visual uh, 
issues, right, um, uh, or like uh, that are unseen during training uh, and still be able to do uh, good um, in test time. So the last part, uh, you know, which uh, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to quickly show you is um, what we call sec former, which can uh, give you a very rich uh, uh, semantic uh, representation, right, uh, for segmentation, but also be robust to all kinds of corruptions that are not seen during training. So um, this you can see here. Um, is uh, the sec former uh, uh, being able to handle all kinds of different noise here, right? So once the noise is there, because uh, the other model, where, which uh, is very, you know, kind of sensitive to unseen noise, whereas sec former in a zero shot way is able to handle noise. And um, what makes this possible um, is this, um, lightweight, let me go directly to this architecture here, right, is the lightweight uh, decoder architecture that is just all MLP. But the encoder has this hierarchical transformer in a pyramidal structure and, um, you know, doesn't have positional encoding, so it is uh, lightweight. So overall, right, the main idea is these are lightweight and principled approaches to architecture design, and that provides, um, uh, you know, not just uh, the state of the art results in terms of segmentation, but also a zero shot robustness to all kinds of uh, corruptions. Well, let's... Yeah, so in conclusion, all uh, right, um, we, I showed you disco box, having just simple box supervision uh, we can translate that into refined instant segmentation and dense correspondences by doing self-supervised learning. Uh, I showed you different ways to adapt from synthetic to real data, and the role of uncertainty calibration there is hugely important. And it's also really important for trustworthy AI, for people to be able to interpret how uh, likely are these methods to fail. And the last aspect I showed you, the state-of-the-art transformer design that uh, enables zero-shot robustness uh, to all kinds of corruptions on challenging segmentation tasks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anima. That was a great talk, and we covered a lot of ground and a lot of real-world problems from like using synthetic data, auto-labeling, calibration. So we have a lot of uh, questions popping up in the Q&A chat here. Um, Pooja has a question for us. Uh, she said that you mentioned temperature scaling doesn't work well when there are domain gaps. Uh, what is an example of a domain gap? Like synthetic to real, right? Or being able to you know, training on ImageNet and then using that classifier for real world images. That makes sense. Yeah. And the techniques you outline, it's not just using synthetic data. It's just real world. Anytime you deploy something, the, the distribution might change. And so these are quite widely applicable techniques. Exactly. Um, Pooja has another question. Uh, does calibrating uncertainty deteriorate the model's performance on the target task? Uh, no, it doesn't, uh, because we saw we get the state-of-the-art uh, adaptation, right? Because uh, uncertainty calibration, in fact, is a step in doing domain adaptation uh, in many of these techniques. That makes sense, and actually gives you more information when you actually deploy it. Like, should you actually trust <laughs> the model? And, it, and it's actually more real-world useful, I guess, uh, as a model. Makes sense. Precisely. Yeah. Um, Vishisht has a question for us. He says, uh, for uncertainty estimation, are we relying on the domain classifier confidence as a measure of the uncertainty? Yes, we are. Um, but the idea is, and, and even there, we could further refine it, right? But the idea is, you know, when you have uh, such a big uh, difference between your target and the training data, right? And then that's what we care about, right? We care about the extremes where we know there is a big shift and we should lower the confidence. Uh, so in that sense, you can uh, still trust the domain classifier. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we have a new question from Sebastian that's gotten a bunch of upvotes uh, as well. Uh, it says, it seems it's easier to make label invariant transformations in image over text. Um, if you agree, what are your thoughts on the future of synthetic data or data augmentation on text data uh, or text tasks like summarization, paraphrasing, NLU, et cetera? 
Yeah, I guess with text, we have tons of data, right? So, I mean, right. not label data, but, uh, you know, the generation task, uh, we can have all the text we want. But the problem is, again, curation, right? So, uh, you know, how what kind of biases are already built into this? And uh, they're all very complex. And, you know, how do we um, determine if this is factual? Because some of, say, the gender bias could, in fact, right uh, be factual like you know women are paid on average less than men right uh, there is a pay gap so yes that is a difference in gender but that's a factual one versus something that is um, discriminatory right so how do we uh, say you know, do this at scale that is the real challenge so in that case it's not about the lack of raw data but you know, given also these models are already trained and we can't afford to retrain them all the time. Is there post hoc? Can we do something to overcome these biases? And that's a big problem. That makes sense. No, that wonderful point there about like text data already have a lot of data, but but need to sort of curate it better or analyze the performance. Um, Unfortunately, we are out of time, so we won't be getting to the other questions. There was a question about what happened to the previous questions. We will be forwarding them to the speakers. We might be also addressing them in the chat. Uh, so a huge thank you to Anima. Thank you so much for joining us and for, for sharing your expertise with us here today. Thank you, Arthur.